Welcome to the Plant Centered and Thriving Podcast. I'm your host, Ashley Kitchens. Welcome to the show, Plant Centered Listener. My name is Ashley. And I'm Katie. And today we have a very exciting guest for you, which we will talk about in a minute. But Katie, I'm really excited because we've got some fun things coming up. We have just been busy little bees. We have. <laughs> <laughs> so part of it. So we created this event coming up this Sunday, July 23rd. It's a meal prepping live event. And we had gotten some questions and some feedback, you know, with, when you go to meal prep on Sunday, sometimes it's just a drag. It's like, oh, I'm doing this again by myself. It's boring. So we wanted to make this Sunday for you very exciting and very fun. And we're going to do it together. So yeah. there is a special link in the show notes that you can use if you want to sign up for it. Spots are limited, but I am just so pumped to be able to meal prep live with you. So what we're going to do, Katie, is when someone signs up, we'll send them a five day, we'll send you a five day meal plan to follow, which you can choose to follow or not. It's 100% plant-based. It's also whole food, plant-based and gluten-free friendly. Cause I myself am plant-based and gluten-free. And so you can choose to follow that meal plan, or you can create your own meal plan for the week and bring that and prep that one with us. <laughs> Or you can just get your popcorn and just watch with us and just hang out. <laughs> right? Just enjoy the show for a couple hours. Yeah. It's cheaper than going to the movies. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Much cheaper. And also we are going to be doing a Q&A throughout. So if you have questions, you can definitely type them. There'll be a chat box where you can type them in throughout the meal prepping session. But then at the end specifically, I am going to leave time, uh, whether it's 30 minutes or 60 minutes, I'm not going anywhere that day. So I'll, I'll stay on as long as you need me to, to answer answer your questions about meal planning, meal prepping, plant-based eating. I've been meal planning and meal prepping almost every single week for six years. So I really tried to fine tune this process to, and then be able to teach you how to make it just really easy on yourself because it's changed my life. And I feel like it has the potential to change a lot of other people's lives, especially if you're new to plant-based eating. Yeah. Why do you meal prep anyway, Ashley? What's the, what's the, what's all the hype about? <laughs> that is a good question. So if it stemmed from many, many years ago, I was in therapy and my therapist suggested it because I was like really stressed and anxious during the week. I was going to the grocery store all the time, spending way too much money eating out. My meals are basically just all over the place. And so she suggested it. And I was like, I am not going to meal prep on a Sunday. I was like, that sounds so lame. That's the lamest advice I've ever heard. Um, well, she was right. <laughs> so two years later, about two years later, I gave it a try and my week changed drastically. It was like, I didn't have to think about what I was going to eat for the week. I didn't have to think about where am I going to get my lunch? Am I going to have to stop by the grocery store on my way home from work to pick up ingredients for dinner? Everything was prepped, ready to go. It was organized. And because it was organized, I felt more organized. And so it was just a game changer. And also at that time, I, I was probably, I was several years into my plant-based journey, but it just made eating plant-based so much easier as well because the meals were already prepped and ready to go. And so again, it was just one less thing to think about. So that's why I talk about meal planning and meal prepping so much because it's changed my life so drastically. And I feel like it can have the potential to change other people's lives too. Absolutely. I know that was one of the first things that Ashley suggested when we started working together. And like she said, when you're first starting plant-based eating, or even if you're a couple years into it, it just makes planning and making sure that you have all the nutrients that you have, that you're getting enough calories, that you're getting enough variety, that you're really devoting time and prioritizing time to kind of plan out what that's going to look like. And, you know, for me, especially it helped me de-stress the week, but also help me make choices that aligned more with my goals rather than making choices like out of convenience for the week. Cause I was like, I don't want to go to the grocery store. I don't want to cook. It's been like a 14 hour day. Like, please right. like, let me just go through the drive through. And so that was such a huge game changer for me. So we are big cheerleaders for meal planning <laughs> and meal prepping. We are. So there's a special link below where you can sign up again. It's this Sunday, July 23rd, and we would love to see you there. It's going to be a lot of fun. Yay. We're 
excited. So that's next weekend. What were you up to this week, Ashley? You look very tan. <laughs> oh, this weekend. Oh my goodness. So I got pretty sunburned on my back. <laughs> uh oh. I feel like a, I feel like a lot of people can relate to this when you I just did not think about it, which I'm kind of beating myself up for a little bit, but like I went out and weeded for about three hours and just Whoa. forgot to put sunscreen <laughs> on my back. So that was a huge mistake. And I feel like a lot of us who work out in the yard, I'm sure you can relate to this, that you just maybe forget a spot or don't put it on. And yeah, so my back is a little burnt, but Hey, the weeds are gone and the front yard is looking good. So, <laughs> Oh, I bet that's such a good feeling. Yeah. Yeah. It was definitely a good feeling. And then what I ended up doing on Saturday night was after being sunburned, I went and got (laughs) hot pot. Have you ever tried that? No, but I've heard of it. Uh, It's kind of going around recently. So I think there's actually a place in Cary down by you, but then a place opened up recently in Durham, North Carolina. And basically what it is, if you're not familiar with it is it's essentially this like hot broth soupy thing that's like in the middle Mm. of a table and it's heated and you're able to put ingredients in it and cook them and eat them. I mean, it is delicious. Yeah. So in the place we went to had tons of tofu options, vegetables. I mean, it was really fantastic. So highly recommend if you haven't tried it, it's definitely a fun thing to do with a group of people. Oh, nice. Sounds very interactive. (laughs) Yes. Very interactive. Yes. And it can be a little messy, but it's, it's worth it. (laughs) I used to love that as a kid going to like, um, ours is called Conki, but I think other places call like Benihana where they like cook in front of you on the grill. Uh, so I like a different option where you're kind of like, uh, it's like fondue, like very, very interactive keeps dinner exciting. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. It's definitely fun to switch it up. So it (laughs) it was so, I mean, you you live in North Carolina, you live like 30 minutes from me. So you know how hot it's been. And so indoor activities are usually preferred. And so (laughs) I end up doing an escape room with a group of people as well. Nice. So if you've ever, if you haven't tried an escape room, I highly recommend it. It's just, it's something fun to do. It's a great indoor activity if it's like really hot outside or if you're just looking to switch things up. So um, we did not escape. It was an incredibly hard escape room. <laughs> oh but no, you didn't escape. That's, that will just stay with me forever. I love I an escape room. But man, I get mad if I don't win. <laughs> yes, it was, it was a tough one for sure. So we were all like, man, like we, it, we think it probably would have taken us another hour to actually escape. There were like probably 20 plus locks. Like it was just, it was wild. So <laughs> a lot of fun, a lot of fun. <laughs> if you've never been, you get like three hints and that's my goal is to like not use any of the hints either. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was funny. because You just have to. I know. Yeah. Cause he, the director, he was like, how hardcore are you all? Like, do you want some hints here and there? And one of our members, he was like, no, no hints. hints. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, oh boy. So we ended up getting a couple of hints and they helped, but man, we needed like probably like 20 more. So. <laughs> oh, I love an escape room. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Okay. So Katie, I'm curious. Cause you got to interview our guest for today. Dr. (laughs) Melanie Joy. So I'm really excited to hear just kind of the introduction to your interview and then obviously listen to the interview itself. I cannot wait for this one. Okay. So actually I had to pinch myself when we got the yes, that Dr. Melanie Joy was going to be on our podcast. If you guys don't know, Dr. Melanie Joy is one of the OGs. So we recently did her book, uh, Why We Love Dogs, Eat Pigs, and Wear Cows um, for our book club. And it was mind-blowing. So she is one of the, you know, she coined the phrase carnism, which really changed the landscape of the vegan movement. And this only came out maybe 2010. So not, you know, back in the 80s. It was recently when things really took a big shift. So we're going to talk about what carnism is and why that, why you should know what that is and how that affects your behavior and your decisions. Uh, But we really talk about her other books too, that she's really diving into. If you guys don't know, she's a Harvard educated psychologist and she is really diving into interpersonal relationships. And if you guys have recently transitioned to going plant-based, you may have had some 
pushback from family, mm. from friends, from coworkers, from the people in your life where, you know, they have noticed that you have started to change how you eat and your relationship may be affected. So it was a really interesting conversation just from a personal aspect because it was my first solo podcast. <laughs> so you guys be gentle. <laughs> <laughs> Ashley started me off with a big gun. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so my first one was this Harvard educated psychologist, uh, you know, that started veganism, but it's okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not intimidating at all. Um, but she was, she could not have been nicer. And we really dive into, you know, how to be a good vegan advocate, giving yourself grace on, you know, we talk about kind of as a new plant-based person or vegan person, you may feel pressure to watch these kind of factory farm videos and like kind of torture yourself with these things. And she talks about how to deal with that, how to deal with pressure of not being a perfect plant-based person. Oh, wow. uh, so and a lot of us get pressure, like we have to be the perfect, you know, image of a vegan and change our whole lives overnight. We talk about how to deal with that and then certainly how to deal with, you know, family and friends kind of questioning your choices or pressuring you to, to eat how you used to eat. And she gives us so many resources, free resources that we're going to include in the show notes at the end mm -hmm. for you guys to, you know, help with those relationships. So we cannot wait for you guys to hear this episode. <laughs> I am so excited for it. I cannot wait to listen myself. <laughs> I, know, I know this is the first one you haven't heard. You weren't there That's for right. it. <laughs> All right, Katie. Well, I cannot wait to listen to this episode. So go ahead and take it away with your interview with Dr. Melanie Joy. Here we go. All right, listeners, let's welcome Dr. Melanie Joy. Thank you, Melanie, for being here. We're so excited. Oh, thanks. It's a, it's a pleasure. And you know, we've just been <laughs> chatting for a couple of minutes before starting and you're so, I can tell immediately I've done so many interviews and I just immediately feel like, oh, this is going to be such a, just such a lovely interview. You're so easy to talk to and your energy is great. So thank oh, you. Oh, good. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Uh, right back at you. <laughs> uh, well, Melanie, we really want to just kind of dive right in and really understand how in the world you got to where you are? Where did your, you know, vegan journey start? I'm so excited to hear this. Yeah, thank you. I, it started a long time ago. It started in childhood, actually, um, early childhood, a childhood, as a matter of fact. Um, you know, like like many people um, in the U.S. in the Western world, in many places in the world, actually, I grew up with a dog who I I loved. Um, and like most people, I also grew up eating animals um, on a regular basis. And throughout the first part of my life, you know, for, for, for many years, actually, I never thought about how strange it was that I could be, you know, petting my dog with one hand while I ate a pork chop with the other. Um, a pork chop that had once been an animal who was at least as intelligent and, and sentient as my dog. I just, you know, didn't make the connection between the meat on my plate and the living being it once was. But all of that completely changed in 1989. I was 23 years old and um, I ate a, a hamburger that turned out to have been contaminated with Campylobacter, which is basically like the salmonella of the red meat world. Um, wow. And yeah. And I got really like wildly ill. I have never been so sick, had never been so sick before and have never been so sick again in my life. Um, so I wound up in the hospital, I was on intravenous antibiotics, um, and I thought I was going to die, and and I didn't. And um, but after that, um, I just I stopped eating meat um, because I was disgusted. It wasn't like any sort of conscious decision or ethical decision, at least not to my conscious awareness. Right? I was just disgusted by the last thing that I had eaten that had gotten me so sick. I was one of several people actually that was hospitalized for it. So, oh wow, yeah, I had eaten at this restaurant that apparently had an outbreak. So, I was um, so I kind of became a vegetarian by accident essentially, and so of course I had to like learn how to cook for myself and you know learn how to shop for myself. And in my exploration of how to do this, I of course stumbled upon information about animal agriculture. 
And that's where things really began. What I learned just shocked and horrified me. I just, I couldn't believe the extent of harm to non-human animals. You know, like more animals are slaughtered globally in one day than the total number of people killed in all wars throughout history. I mean, this is staggering. And this is, this is for animal agribusiness. Um, and I, I, I could not, I couldn't wrap my brain around the around the extent of the harm and the suffering to, to animals and of course to the environment. And this was back in 89 where they didn't even know nearly what they know today. And I was shocked at what I was doing to my body by consuming these products. Um, but what shocked me in some ways even more than the information I was learning was that nobody I talked to about this information was willing to hear what I had to say. And these were like rational people. They were compassionate, compassionate people. These were like justice-minded people. Um, you know, people who cared about their animals, who loved their dog, who loved our family dog. The response, whenever I tried to share this information with people, was always something along the lines of, "Don't tell me that you'll ruin my meal," or they'd call me uh, a radical, you know, <laughs> uh, a, a, a radical vegan hippie propagandist i had become vegan, <laughs> you know in this journey of discovery and i was just like what is going on it was like i had woken up in the midst of this global insanity you know this collective insanity and so you know i just became very curious as to how rational caring people like i had been you know eating animals could just stop thinking and feeling when it came to this issue of animal agriculture so what was going on here and so this was what really catalyzed the the journey of the work that's led me to this conversation today i um i eventually ended up doing a phd in psychology and i i studied broadly the psychology of violence and nonviolence or we can say of oppression and, and transfer social transformation in some ways um, and I narrowly looked at, you know, my doctoral dissertation, I um, studied the psychology of eating animals. And so I figured if I could understand what's going on, you know, in people's minds that enable, you know, good people to participate in harmful practices, you know, then maybe we can figure out how to change this way of thinking to, to help people sort of reconnect with their authentic th thoughts and feelings when it comes to this issue um, and become proactive in the solution instead of, you know, passive bystanders enabling the problem. And so this work that I did on my doctoral dissertation, which, you know, we can dig into, um, ended up becoming uh, published through my book, Why We Love Dogs, Eat Pigs, and Wear Cows. Um, and it's on the psychology, essentially the psychology of eating animals. Yeah, I just find it funny, like back way back in 89, thinking about those people that kind of called you a dirty hippie and just just wait, <laughs> just wait till I where I end up. <laughs> Well, I mean, one motivation I can say for writing the book was like, I was like, I can't say this. I'm saying the same thing to my friends and my family. I'm saying the same thing 30 different ways and it's not getting through. I'm like hitting this wall. Fine. I'll write a book. Then you'll all have to read it because you'll feel guilty if you don't. Um, and I honestly did help. <laughs> help things in the family department. Yeah. Well, how was it in the beginning where you have these people that you love and you care about and, and you're you know, you're passionate about this change that you're making for very good reason, yeah. um, but you're getting this pushback. How did you handle that pushback? Did it cause a lot of conflict in the beginning? Uh, it caused some conflict. I have to say that my family um, were largely very, uh, they were vegan, what I call vegan allies or vegan supporters. They were very supportive um, of me, although this, this wasn't immediately, I should say. This, this was a little bit, you know, a little bit later. At first, they were, you know, my mother was terrified that I wasn't going to live to see my 30th birthday. I was 23. She could <laughs> me eggs, at least eat eggs. You've got to get some protein. And, you know, and now she's like 80 and she's gone vegan. She went vegan a few years ago. Um, so, oh, wow. You, you know, finally got her. <laughs> here's a well, the, book, the book really helped, actually. Yeah. Um, but, you know, they were more like kind of concerned about me and like what's mm -hmm. going on. Um, I, but there were a handful of family members that were actually, there was quite some pushback. You know, my immediate family, fortunately, was, was relatively okay. But 
you know, I mean, I think most people listening to this can can understand the experience of like how you stop eating animals, you know, for whatever reason. Maybe it's for, you know, concerns about your own health or concerns about the health of the environment or the health of the animals, you know, who are being turned into to, to products for humans to consume. You know, we all come at this from, from different angles, but with the same, you know, sort of mission in a way, which is to, to increase the health and well-being of, you know, our bodies and or maybe the bodies of others in the planet. Um, so I think most listeners can probably relate to the fact that all you have to do is say, I'm vegan. And all of a sudden, like you can feel this wall going up, you know, <laughs> you know don't tell me that we ruin my meal. And also so many vegans have told me over the years, and this was also my experience as well, when I first became vegan, it's not anymore, but you know, that becoming vegan and being vegan in some ways, um, for whatever reason you become vegan is one of the most empowering decisions that, that people make. I mean, it's a very profound life altering decision in many ways. And I'm not saying that veganism is the solution to all the world's problems. It's certainly a part of the solution, right? But it's very, very important, you know, personal choice that people make. And, um, and yet that sort of sense of empowerment and inspiration quickly turns to shock and horror when they start talking to people about this decision that they're so excited about. And all of a sudden they find that communication and, and relationships break down and there's a real struggle. And this was certainly a problem that I had you know, also when I was like, you know, dating people, it was really hard because how do you feel close to people? How do you maintain an authentic, deep enough connection with people who are participating in something that you find deeply offensive and, and probably traumatic in some ways? Like many people who don't eat animals sit at the dinner table and see dead animals on the dinner table. They're what they're seeing is not food. They might, you know, they used to see it as food before they were vegan, um, but now they're seeing it as a carcass, you know, as somebody, not something, but someone who had a horrible life and a horrible death and that they can't get out of their minds sometimes when they're looking at it. How do you stay connected with people who are participating in this and, and exposing you to it and then maybe even reacting with hostility? when you try to share the discomfort that you feel and calling you controlling or a picky eater or hypersensitive or, you know, a human hater or all, you know, throwing all these stereotypes. <laughs> at. That's, it's a, it's, a, it's very much a challenge um, for, for people, for, for many, many people, understandably so. Um, and it was for me as well. And it was one of the things that um, led me to do the work I, I did and you know really a deep dive into to all things relationships that's the other hat I wear I was a I was actually a relationship coach for a long time very very interested in relationships and obviously psychology I'm a psychologist and later on after I published why we love dogs seven years later I wrote another book called beyond beliefs um, a guide to improving relationships and communication for vegans vegetarians and meat eaters um, because I was hearing story after story after story um, that so many people stop eating animals and their relationships and communication just completely break down and it's it's heartbreaking and and it's not necessary it doesn't have to happen yeah and you know i think especially as a new vegan you know once you cross that line where you've seen what you've seen and you've kind of bared witness to kind of these horrific videos about kind of the the behind the scenes of factory farming and really understanding where our food comes from it's hard to imagine going back and kind of unseeing that so so what do you recommend for new vegans and kind of their you know opinion on or, or their place in advocacy do you do you recommend that they kind of follow this you know leading by example until they find their footing or do you recommend them kind of you know going you know not uh shying away from uh you know these difficult conversations what a great question that is um it, the answer is it really depends, you know, it, 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 I, I would say for everybody, new vegans and, you know, established vegans or less new vegans, however you want to put it, you know, um, understanding is, is really important. It's a key to empowerment. So really understanding, you know, number one, understanding the psychology of what I call carnism, and, and we can talk about that a little bit, which is what I wrote about and why we love dogs, the psychology that conditions people to basically the, this belief, carnism is the invisible belief system that conditions people to eat certain animals and it creates a certain psychology. I call this the carnistic mentality. Understanding the carnistic mentality and how carnism is structured, how it affects people's perceptions and causes this level of defensiveness that we experience and the way that this gets expressed and often um, projected onto vegans who then are forced to go on the defensive. Like 
it's, you know, there's a lot of mental gymnastics that vegans have to go through to navigate relationships and communication with other vegans as well, you know, sometimes. So, so really one thing I would recommend for everybody is whether you want to be an active advocate or not is really understand the psychology of carnism, understand the psychology of people who are being, you know, acting defensively against you. So you can learn to communicate in a way that that bypasses these defenses rather than reinforces them, right? So often we open our mouths and we start to have a conversation and we get into, it's not a conversation anymore, it becomes this divisive debate rather than a constructive dialogue. And we get into this, um, you know, these like this battle of justifications, like, yes, but we wouldn't have to worry about what to do with all the animals if people stopped eating them because we wouldn't be breeding them <laughs> in the first place. You, know, you need to like have your sound bites and your talking points and know your facts, but it's really important to understand the psychology so you don't get caught up in it um, and you don't buy into some of the negative messages you as a vegan may hear about yourself. Many vegans have, for example, internally internalized these negative messages that are promoted in society and that get you know, communicated through our own friends and family sometimes. Um, systems like carnism are structured to keep themselves alive. And one of the ways they do this is by conditioning people to feel defensive against, to resist the very information that would help them think outside of that box, right? So basically, people are conditioned to like reject uh, information or to feel defensive against uh, or resist information about veganism. And that means, you know, rejecting vegans and what they have to say. And one of the ways this shows up is through negative stereotyping of vegans. So a vegan will start talking about veganism, you know, it's very innocently like, you know, here, oh, you, you asked me why I'm vegan and I'm telling you, and now all of a sudden I'm hearing all of you <laughs> right. wrong about my own <laughs> lifestyle, which you actually never even understood until somebody told you what a vegan was five minutes ago, which is why you wanted to talk to me and ask me the question. Suddenly you're <laughs> all the reasons I'm wrong about this, right? <laughs> And then and the vegan will hear things like, you know, oh, you're overly sensitive, like, oh, you're mm -hmm. just a sentimentalist animal lover, you know, and so, and many vegans actually internalize this and, and, and actually try to hide their sensitivity. Oh, I don't want somebody to think, you know, I'm just overly sensitive, so we might try to hide it, except that, like, when we understand carnism and the way that it's structured, we, we can recognize this distortion for what it is. Like, when we really step back and think about it, um, you know, the emotions of grief and anger and sadness and, and whatever else um, to are these emotions that, that many vegans carry around. Um, these are actually healthy, legitimate, normal emotional responses to the global atrocity that is carnism. You know, much more concerning is the apathy and the numbing of the dominant culture. So, you know, we can reclaim our sensitivity and also appreciate that you know, this this uh, projection or stereotype of being overly sensitive, that's been used to silence the voices of people who challenge oppression throughout history. I mean, people who were, you know, working against African slavery, the abolitionists were called, you know, sentimentalists and women, you know, suffragettes were called hysterical. You know, somebody by definition who's overly emotional isn't rational and people who are not rational are not worth listening to. So this stereotype is a, a form of shoot the messenger, right? If you shoot the messenger, you don't have to take seriously the implications of their message. Now, this was sort of a long-winded example, but I really want listeners to, to take this point in, which is like, knowledge is power. And when you recognize these cognitive distortions, these psychological distortions for what they are, when you understand these stories and stereotypes that have been created by carnistic culture, you are much less likely to apologize for something like your sensitivity, which is a beautiful thing and a gift that the world needs much more of, not less of, you know, and much less likely to feel bad about yourself and pathologize yourself and apologize for who and how you are. Um, so, so really getting informed about carnism. And I would say the other thing that can go a very long way for, for new vegans um, and all vegans, all people, <laughs> is learning. <laughs> build what I call relational literacy, which is the understanding of and ability to practice healthy ways of relating. And we can talk about this and unpack it a little bit more later if you want to. But when you build relational literacy, you know, a big part of that is learning effective communication. Communication is the primary way we relate. Um, you kind of develop this superpower where everything in your life gets a lot easier a lot easier. Most of us, you know, have to learn complicated geometry that we'll probably never need to use. And yet we don't get a single formal lesson in how to relate in a way that's healthy and how to communicate effectively. 
And like, when you look at the most pressing problems in our world and in our lives, these are not problems that exist because we don't know how to do geometry. So, you know, most of us never get a formal lesson in how to relate in a way that's healthy and just building your relational literacy, even if you just build it by, you know, 10% of what it is now can be completely game changing for you and help you navigate relationships and communications with everybody, not just people who don't share your philosophy or ideology. And, and certainly that has more applications than just kind of uh, confronting your aunt about veganism at Thanksgiving. Right. <laughs> uh, it has to do with, you know, your your partner's relationships and, you know, boss employee relationships. And so, you know, the, the trickle down effect is is great there for sure. <laughs> Yeah, right. uh, you know, vegans are people and, you know, people have relationships and people struggle in relationships. So, yeah, this changes your whole life and your relationship with yourself. And, you know, and when it comes to advocacy, whether you want to be actively advocating or not, you know, I mean, you are always if you are a vegan, you know, or you're not eating animals, simply whenever you open your mouth and you're communicating about the issue, you are you are acting as an advocate, whether you're doing so intentionally or not. So it's a really good idea to build your advocacy skills. It'll help you avoid tricky situations and conflicts that you don't want to get into, probably you don't need to get into. Um, you learn learn when not to advocate, you know, and then when you are communicating, you know, when you really just want to not have that conversation and when you are advocating, you know, you can learn how to do that effective, more effectively. And that can also go a long way to your own you know, helping you feel more sustainable and not get exhausted yeah. from these conversations and, yeah. um, and being a good ambassador for the cause. Um, our Center for Effective Vegan Advocacy, we have at, at our Center for Effective Vegan Advocacy, we have a lot of courses and materials, webinars. Oh, great. Um, yeah, a lot of free materials for people. Oh, great. That's fantastic. And we'll definitely link that in the show notes for our listeners. Uh, we're always looking for, you know, scripts and, and uh, you know, inspiration for people dealing with those kind of difficult conversations, especially if they're, they're new at this. <laughs> yeah, um, for scripts we have in my book and beyond beliefs. Um, I'm happy to share this with you. You can have the PDF you can oh, read yeah. it out to your listeners. Um, I can send you, we can, or Narali can send you the PDF, but I actually have scripts in the back of that book and the appendices Oh, wonderful! for anybody who wants to like, you know, share a message with the people, you know, this th in their lives, this is what the world looks like through my eyes as a vegan. And we also have a seven minute video, which is called, um, uh, what to say to vegans. And basically it's a video version of this is, if you were a vegan, this is what the world would look like through your eyes. And this is why it's so challenging for so many people to be vegan. And here's what you can say to vegans to help establish and create greater connection. Wow. Uh, you know, having, having all of those resources from you is like, you know, it's, it's a must have before you go vegan. Uh, so we'll definitely include those in the show notes so people know, uh, they can have a, have a, have a good starting place again for those, those difficult conversations. So in terms of, you know, the landscape of advocacy, I'm sure it's changed a lot mm -hmm. since you wrote, you know, why we love dogs, even though there's some conflicts, you know, once you've decided maybe to go vegan with your family, there's also can be some divisiveness, like you mentioned, in the movement in and of itself that can be a little bit uh, of a deterrent sometimes. So how have you found navigating those changes over the years in terms of like, uh, I know a lot of our audience, a lot of the things that they deal with is kind of like the expectation to be the perfect vegan immediately or to kind of go vegan overnight. And if you're not able to do that, then you're kind of kicked out of the club. Uh, so I'm sure you've seen kind of a change, you know, and maybe it comes in waves. Uh, but how do you feel about uh, how have you navigated that over there kind of being a, a pioneer and kind of an icon of the movement? How do you how do you deal with the the, the kind of divisiveness among the the vegan members themselves? Yeah, I mean, you you uh make a good point where you talk about you know the landscape sort of having changed over the years right the movement's very different now than it was when mm -hmm. i first stopped dating animals of course and it's really come a long way i mean veganism has just really mushroomed everywhere around the i mean i want to say everywhere to my knowledge everywhere i've been talking about this issue in i think 50 some odd countries now and i haven't seen an exception yet um you know where where support for veganism and awareness of veganism is really growing tremendously and as such, the movement has gotten much more um, professionalized in a sense. Like, you know, we used to have 
it was all volunteer groups doing the vast majority of the work. I mean, I would say still probably there's, you know, all volunteer groups are doing a huge amount of work. And we also have big professional organizations now. We've got like large numbers of paid staff and, you know, the messaging has gotten a lot more polished. You've got professionals coming into the movement who know marketing and PR and strategy. So it's been really interesting to, to see this change. And, and so veganism is becoming more mainstream. It's becoming easier to talk about. And, you know, with this, just like with any movement, um, whether it's in the early stages or in later stages, people have differences and, you know, it gets even more diverse as it, as time goes on, the movement becomes more and more diverse because it's attracting a lot of different people for a lot of different reasons. And to, in answer to, you know, your question, um, number one, there is a certain amount of infighting in the movement. And I think that's what you're alluding to is, you know, vegans ha who have certain ideas about the way to promote veganism, feeling like this is the right way. And if you don't do it this way, then, you know, you're hurting the cause or you're not really vegan or, you know, whatever it might be. First of all, not all forms of advocacy are equally effective. You know, some of them are actually counterproductive. Some of the more common ones are, in fact, really counterproductive. We have a course called The Science of Effective Vegan Advocacy, where we talk about- Oh, great. Know, science has shown, like, what are the methods that actually work? Is a full vegan, go vegan ask, you know, is it more likely to get people to change than an incremental ask, which is encouraging people to move towards change incrementally or more slowly. The science suggests that the latter is the case. Um, you know, I always recommend that people say, you know, instead of saying reduce or asking for people to reduce or go vegan to ask or suggest that people consider becoming as vegan as possible, which is actually changing incrementally, but with the awareness of the direction that you're moving in. And, you know, it's, it also lowers people's defensiveness to that ask. Um, infighting is normal in movements. Um, you know, people are different and people have different ideas. T people's, most people, as I said, haven't built relational literacy and many people relate to their differences in a way that um, turns those differences into divisive debates when instead they could be productive conversations. Veganism is no, you know, the vegan movement is, is, is no exception. We are, um, one of our main projects this year that we're launching is End Infighting. And it's a, a substantial project that we've been working on for quite some time. And uh, the past couple of years, I've done a deep dive into all things infighting. And, you know, one of the main components of this project, besides my, I'm, I'm giving four hour workshops and shorter workshops for advocates on, on how to learn to be, you know, to, to end infighting, essentially prevent in, in, infighting. Um, oh, wow. Building out a, a pretty substantial website where anybody can go from any movement actually to learn what are the key causes of infighting you know what are the costs of infighting we're talking about massive amounts of money to to movements and um and you know how can i become immediately proactive in helping to end this problem so um that's going to be people who are interested the website's not up yet but you can just go to infighting.org and um you'll have a lot of resources there but one of the issues really about, you know, when, when it comes to infighting is that vegans are people and people have differences, as I said. And, and when we don't learn how to communicate, how to build relational literacy, essentially, then we relate to our differences in a way that causes us to become opponents and feel like opponents, you know, when in fact we are, we are all working toward the same end. Um, there are a number of like key causes of infighting, not having high levels of relational literacy is one of them. Another one is that many people in the vegan movement have certain, a certain degree of trauma or traumatization. I mean, you mentioned this earlier, we've been exposed for, for whatever reason, like even if you've come into this movement, you know, because you're interested in health, chances are if you're subscribing to, you know, you're writing about plant-based eating, you're subscribing to any kind of vegan feeds, you are getting exposed to graphic imagery of animal suffering. And um, people can and do become traumatized from this. And when we don't recognize the trauma for what it is, we can end up acting, thinking and acting in ways that drive in fighting when we wouldn't even expect to. So I can give an example of this um, if you feel like that would be helpful. Oh yeah, absolutely. So, so when we, when we become traumatized, um, you know, we can start to develop what, what I call traumatic thinking. It's a mentality. It's a way of thinking whereby we start to look at the world as one giant traumatic event. You know, this is unconscious. People aren't aware of this when this is happening generally, but 
we start to think of the world as one traumatic event with like only three roles to be played. You can either be a victim, you know, and that's what happens in a traumatic event. Or if you're not a victim, you're a perpetrator, right? So you're with us or you're against us. You know, you're a good guy or you're a bad guy. And if you're not a victim and you're not a perpetrator, the third role that you can play is that of a hero. Some people think witness is the third role, but a witness actually is somebody who witnesses and they can be a witness perpetrator if they don't help. And they could be a witness hero if they do. So we start, what happens is when we've become traumatized is we start to think very rigidly and we start to put everyone, including ourselves, into one of these three categories. And, you know, with no nuance, no gray area, you, you're one or the other or the other. And we lose our capacity to appreciate that all of us are complicated, messy people who are, you know, do harmful things and we do less harmful things and we're sometimes victims and we're sometimes perpetrators and we're sometimes heroes. We start to hold ourselves and others to impossible standards, right? And so if you have these rigid categories, you know, if you're not a victim, meaning you're not hanging in a slaughterhouse, you know, and you're not a hero because in this way of thinking, heroes are people who are all good all the time and you just had a glass of wine that wasn't certified vegan, um, you know, right. whatever it may be, <laughs> right? We start we, we can start to develop this really like toxic moral perfectionism. We put vegans on pedestals, we create these vegan heroes, and then we knock them right down again. As soon as one slip up, one selfish statement, one non-vegan whatever, they sipped a cup of coffee that had creamer in it, and that's it. You're, you're a perpetrator. And so you can see this kind of thinking. It's pretty apparent in the movement. Um, and, and this is very, very toxic and it, it's, uh, it's causing a lot of problems and it's one of a number of key drivers of infighting. And so recognizing trauma for what it is and learning how to heal ourselves from trauma and prevent people from getting traumatized, including ourselves, is really, really key to helping heal the movement and heal ourselves. And, you know, one of the ways I have a course on this, actually, um, a, one of our SIVA courses goes over this whole, it's called sustainable vegan advocacy, learning how to be a vegan in a way that's sustainable and doesn't burn you out. And a big part of this is recognizing trauma and treating it. So one of the things you can do right now, if you're listening and thinking, oh my God, that's me, you know, I think I might be traumatized, right? If you notice that you're, you know, starting to feel like you have flashbacks to the terrible, you know, the images that you've seen, or you're starting to feel misanthropic, like you're losing faith in humanity, or you notice that you feel guilty for feeling good. So you can't like, you know, you can't enjoy yourself anymore. You start feeling like, oh my God, whatever I do, it's never enough. You know, you're dysregulated, meaning you're emotionally out of balance. Um, you know, these are key symptoms of trauma. What you can do right now is you can stop witnessing just do not watch those videos. Do not look at those images. Many people, when I say this to them, are like, no, but I have to. I have to because I feel guilty if I stop. And I say, well, why do you feel guilty? And they say, well, because com considering what the animals go through, I mean, the least I can do is spend two minutes seeing it. Except that two minutes is not stopping those animals from going through what they're going through. What that two minutes is doing is feeding your trauma and making you less effective at what you do and increasing the chances that you're gonna burn out and probably take people down with you because that's what burnout often does. So stop witnessing, don't make others unintentional witnesses. You know, very often vegans, you know, they wanna shock people with the graphic. <laughs> right. You know, this feeling like I gotta bang you over the head with it to wake you up. <laughs> I mean, the problem with that, it's understandable, you know, because people turn away. Denial is the primary defense of carnism. We know people are in denial. We know they want to turn away. We know the don't tell me that you'll ruin my meal. Um, you know, we know this attitude is like deeply, deeply entrenched. And so we were like, okay, how do we break through those defenses? Shock them. But unfortunately, the strategy tends to backfire. Like when you shock right. people with this imagery, you traumatize them. Like you don't know what their trauma history is. You don't know. I mean, I can tell you people have done it to me. And there are things I will never be able to unsee that are not helping right. me be a better advocate, you know? So it's, it's a form of emotional violence when we shock people with this imagery. And they often people will react by looking at us as perpetrators because we've foisted violence on them and their anger gets directed at us vegans, you know, rather than where it should be directed, which is, you know, the, the industry. So don't make other people unintentional witnesses. Just get their consent when you want to share information with them. 
which actually goes a long way. Do not take in any more, you know, graphic imagery yourself, unless you absolutely have to, and some people do, um, to do their jobs. And, you know, practice really good self-care. The, 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 the two things that are fundamental, really, really important to building resilience to trauma, you know, healing from trauma and building resilience are engaging in very good self-care, asking yourself what you need to feel in balance and giving yourself permission to do that and building healthy relational connections with others. And if you can do that, I mean, easier said than done, but work yes. towards that, you know, you'll be able to be a more effective advocate and, a, you know, a, a representative, you know, an ambassador for the cause in a way that, that works better. Yeah, I just feel, I feel so glad that we had you on to give us permission to be okay with, you know, saying no to those videos, because especially for me when, you know, I've been vegetarian for about 13 years. So even just 13 years ago, it was very different. And really the the major advocacy way to, to go about it was this kind of shock value and, and bearing witness to kind of these atrocities that were happening to these animals. And whew, I just can't, I can't, I cannot, you know, as personally, I cannot, uh, you know, I have not, I'll have nightmares and I just won't, won't be able to be a functional human being. So it's so nice to to be able to kind of give ourselves permission that, you know, we don't need to face those things and still be still be a good advocate. And I cannot wait till that website is built out and uh, we'll definitely link the course that you mentioned because I think that would be really, really beneficial to our listeners. You know, we, my organization is Beyond Carnism and, um, you know, our, our one of our, our main program, I should say, is the Center for Effective Vegan Advocacy. And we are, we very much see ourselves as a service organization. We are in service of the people doing great work uh, to help create a more compassionate world for all beings. And, you know, we're there for you. And we want people to come to our website and to avail themselves of our resources. We have a lot of resources that we have, you know, put together over the years after really listening and hearing and thinking about what kind of support is needed and how you know we could best contribute to the to the people who are doing this work and that's your listeners and that's you so come visit us and avail yes. yourself of what we offer <laughs> i cannot wait to uh give all this information to our listeners i know they're going to benefit so much and i think you hit the nail on the head i think you guys are doing a great job because i think that was definitely something that support for these relationship difficulties. I think that is something major that is missing. Uh, so I cannot wait for our listeners to be able to take advantage of that. So when do you expect that to be done, you think? Oh, thank you. Uh, do you mean the infighting or the relationship? The, the work with uh, yeah, the, the website that you're building out for the infighting and everything. The infighting website will be up. Huh? I, I never like to say when websites are going to be I know. Up, <laughs> ideally, ideally, it will be up um, sometime in June. Uh, Great. It's not too long. It's a lot of information that we're putting on there. but um, And then we'll be building it, out, continuing to build it out. But, but sometime in June. And it's really designed to be a one-stop portal. Like, you can come in at any entry point. We're going to have, we're also going to have another site with, like, extra information specifically for vegans. But everything on this website applies to veganism as well as, as other um other advocacy movements and groups. So, um, and also I have a new book coming out called How to End Injustice Everywhere, and that's coming out in September. Oh, great. And yeah, thank you. The last chapter of that is also, it's on infighting. And so okay. this, this book hopefully will also be another resource to really think about how to understand these various systems of, you know, carnism and other isms that we're a part of and how they how they fit together and how we can sort of build our own awareness so that we can be participating in the world in a way that, you know, really reflects our core values to the best of our ability. Yeah, just, you know, you adding that one, your library is just touching on everything that you need to be, you know, a good vegan. So uh, I know you're so proud of all the work that you've done over all these years. Oh, so exciting. Oh, thank you. Well, it's um, a team effort. I mean, I'm, I have a great, I have a great team and a, a great organization. And it's like people like you that, you know, the, are the reason that this work actually can reach anybody and get out there because there's no point in having all of these books and resources if nobody <laughs> knows about them. So yeah, so thank you and, and for what you're doing and providing your listeners with such you know important information to because it's it's not easy when even now even though veganism is becoming mainstream 
it's still people become vegan and they can really easily feel lost and frustrated yes. and isolated and you know the butt of jokes and you know to, even today it's just it's socially acceptable to talk to and about vegans in a way that would be considered mm -hmm. reprehensible you know when yeah. it comes to to other people so or certain other people so it's you know it's really really great to be able to to provide this kind of support for listeners yeah, we actually just had, we have a, a monthly vegan book club and we just had um, your book on in March. So everybody enjoyed it so much. Well, since we are podcasting, the last thing I want to mention is your brand new podcast. You're like, I'm not doing enough. I need to do one more thing <laughs> in my day. Uh, so tell us about uh, Just Beings, your new podcast. Um, well, Just Beings, we had our first season last year. That's a podcast with me and you might know Ivana Lynch. Um, mm -hmm. She was... Uh, she was uh, a Harry Potter actress and she's yeah. also a vegan advocate. <laughs> she had her own podcast of Chick Peeps before that. She's wonderful. And she wrote a great memoir. They got called the opposite of butterfly hunting and she's, she's wonderful. And um, so Ivana and I co-host Just Beings where we talk to people who are, you know, change makers in the world. They're working to change the way that we think, you know, to create a better world for humans, animals, um, and the planet. So we have people on from these different, they come in from these different angles. They're not all vegans who come onto the podcast. And we, we talk about how, you know, the, the interconnectedness of various issues and how, um, you know, what we need to do, but we help people build awareness of issues, critical social issues in the world and, um, you know, and learn how they can become a part of the solution and also build personal empowerment in the process. So we have a psychology focus and uh, this year we're focusing on food systems transformation, which is like a big topic, mm. I know, but really we want listeners to get an understanding of like, what does this mean? This is kind of like the big thing being talked about now, transforming the food system. What is that? But the food system is really at the, the crux. It's like the hub of a wheel of, you know, where there are so many spokes coming out of that and so many problems intersect when it comes to the food system, which is like industrial agriculture, animal agriculture, you know, um, so how do we how do we create a food system that's, you know, where we can work people who want to create a healthier food system can work together, you know, groups who work together as opposed to against each other, you know, people who are trying to protect humans from exploitation and the environment from exploitation and animals from exploitation exploitation and have healthy food to boot. Yeah. And I think that's why I love why we love dogs that eat pigs and wear cows so much is because especially that chapter on the the human aspect and the, and the people that are working in the slaughterhouses and, and how they're affected. It's not just the animals, it's affecting all of us, this kind of industrial food system. So our listeners, I'm sure you can tell talking to Melanie that she doesn't talk at you. She is talking with you and trying to give you all of this information from a very science backed place and not just from an opinion place, a, a pitchfork place, a pushy place. She is coming from a very uh, gentle place. So I'm sure your podcast will will follow suit. So uh, we'll definitely put a link in the show notes for that because we have podcast lovers here. <laughs> oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and our goal is to raise awareness, you know, and again, yeah. to provide people with information that can help them, you know, have more empowered lives and help create a better yeah. world in the process. Yeah. Yep. Well, I am just so proud to talk to you today. Uh, really, it's gonna be it's gonna go down as one of my one of my favorite days for sure. If you told the 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 thirteen year ago vegan that I'd be talk to you talking to you one day, I would not believe it. So we were thrilled to have you today. So last thing is just I know we mentioned a couple of your uh, websites and everything, but in terms of you know the best way that people can connect with you, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so they can come to carnism.org. That's the website, okay. and we yeah. can. Show Share Instagram. We can share our Instagram handles. See, I'm yeah. like not the social media person, so <laughs> I don't even know how to say it. You can connect with us on Instagram. I just can, we can link in the show notes. Yeah, we'll do that. Not a problem. Okay, yeah. It's been such a pleasure, and you know, I like I said in the beginning, I could tell immediately that it would be like a great experience for me talking with you. Oh, thank you. And you're so. <laughs> Yeah, you're just so gracious and you make the conversation really easy and you know your your genuine like desire for your listeners to benefit from the conversation shines through and it makes oh, all the difference in the world when you're having this kind of conversation. So, oh, um, good. listeners are, are very fortunate. So, thank you so much. 
Oh, thank you so much for for uh, being with us. We really appreciate it. And good luck with all of the hard work that you're doing. And we are all going to be watching for that website to come out. Um, but we appreciate you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Until next time, keep thriving. <laughs>